special edition, extra special edition. Oh, love me, they've seen him. They've seen the Ripper. Murder in Whitechapel. Murder. The Ripper's been seen. <laughs> Jack the Ripper is the most famous serial killer of all time. He committed at least five murders in the autumn of 1888. Um, various scholars attribute a couple more murders to him, give or take. Probably he's more famous, not because he committed the murders and got away with it, but because somebody else, almost certainly not him, wrote letters to the police and the newspapers signing them Jack the Ripper, and the name stuck. And there were two reasons for, his, um, for the interest in Jack the Ripper. He was never caught. They, one, they didn't know who Jack the Ripper was. And secondly, he was really a weird serial killer. No one really ever knew who Jack the Ripper was. There are still books being written. There are still clubs. There are still discussion groups. There are suspects, and new suspects are created all the time about who did these crimes in London in 1888. Well, that's, you know, I mean, that, that's a mystery and a horror of legendary proportions. At the time, there was a sense that Jack the Ripper was probably upper middle class. Yeah, a toff with a top hat and a Gladstone bag full of knives out there preying on the underclass. So, yeah, he came from yeah, our neighbourhood. He was an ordinary man. He wasn't the first serial killer on earth, but he was the first serial killer in which the press exploited the crimes to sell newspapers in a metropolis. And as such, it shocked turn-of-the-century London, and almost immediately there were interpretations of the Jack the Ripper uh, crimes in art. Yeah, there have been other unsolved crimes down the decades that, that are remembered in criminological circles. Jack the Ripper is remembered, I think, because of the name. And certainly, the, the f at least the first 50 years of history of Jack the Ripper movies, they have... Yeah, only the name and a few urban legends about Jack the Ripper are used. And The Lodger, of course, was based on a novel by Marie Belloc Lowndes. It was first made by Alfred Hitchcock, amazingly, as uh, The Lodger, A Tale of the London Fog, uh, starring Ivan Novello, uh, the great all-round performer, um, as the mysterious stranger who turns up on the, on the doorstep one night looking for lodgings and slowly but surely becomes... Uh, the chief suspect in the Jack the Ripper killings. Uh, the interesting thing is in the original novel and in Hitchcock's original film, Jack the Ripper is never mentioned. The, the, the character who's obviously based on the Ripper is actually referred to throughout as the Avenger. When Alfred Hitchcock made his first film version of it, it was still the Avenger and it was still in contemporary London. It was in 1926 London, which was more like uh, Mrs. Lowndes had originally envisioned it. Now, when 20th Century Fox decided to do it, he became Jack the Ripper. It was 1888 London. He was killing, well, actresses because the, the censors decreed that it couldn't, you know, the name prostitute couldn't be used. However, we, you know, you and I both know that they, he was killing prostitutes. One of the novelties of The Lodger and how it's original and different is that it's a much more lavishly budgeted picture, uh, a lot more production value, and the interpretation of the horror actor is so different, so novel, so audacious. Uh, this is not just some werewolf growing a big face of special effects hair. This is a man who is showing off all of this sexual aberration. And this was frightening to an audience, something they really hadn't experienced, something that, that uh, movies didn't offer every day. This was, this was very daring stuff. John Brahm was a master of atmosphere and mood. He could use the camera, angles, moving shots, lighting, to create a mood of impending doom, as well as anybody, as well as Jacques Tourneur at RKO. And he used that to great advantage, of course, in Undying Monster, but even more so when it came to do an adaptation of The Lodger, because in a gothic setting, in a sort of turn-of-the-century London setting, his Germanic style was perfectly suited. First of all, he did wonderful visual things. Secondly, he played up this sex angle with Merle Oberon, who is very attractive in the film, very effective as the heroine, and he let Kriegar loose. 
he let him do what he wanted to do, and the result is probably the greatest horror film of the 1940s. This is a beautiful old Bible. It is my aunt's office. You'll leave it here. If you'd like to have it. Mine, too, are the problems of life and death. The thing that Barr Linden really was concerned about was that he had to make him sympathetic both for the audience acceptance and for the censors to ever let this go. He had to give him some kind of an angle. He had to give the lodgers some kind of a sympathetic pathos that would uh, get by. And so, of course, he had the whole thing about that loose women had ruined his, the lodger's brother. And, of course, on paper, that's somewhat sympathetic. Of course, when Kriegar was through with it, you know, he hated women because they had ruined his brother and he had been in love with his brother and he gazed lustfully at his brother's picture. And these other things ended up in the movie that weren't actually on paper in the script. So they had to somehow or other get this script past the censors, first of all, a Jack the Ripper movie. And of course they got rid of the prostitutes and they got rid of the garters and they got rid of these other things that they thought, well, we can't have that. What they couldn't get rid of was Laird Krieger's imagination. Laird Krieger was fast becoming the villain on the 20th Century Fox lot. He was, a, he was a fine actor, very soft-spoken, very unusual looking. He was six foot three, he was 300 pounds, and he had those soulful eyes. And that coupled with a, a really quite fascinating acting technique made him the perfect candidate to play Jack the Ripper. And he really rewarded their choice by making some pretty interesting acting choices himself in the part because he didn't play it as a raving maniac even though his lines could have been delivered that way, he played it as a man who was polite, who was shy, who was soft-spoken, and somehow that made him even more frightening and more believable. The reason The Lodger works so well is because, although Krieger is not top build, his, his is the central performance of the film. He basically carries the entire film on his, on his large, sweaty shoulders throughout. And he is supported by a phenomenally good cast that includes uh, Cedric Hardwick, and uh, George Sanders. For Brown, one of the great things would have been, and for other directors working at, at Fox uh, at that time, was this wonderful team of actors that were there, the kind of family of, of actors that they had, George Sanders and so forth. It's a great thing to have, um, because you're, you're casting from within a, a known realm, uh, and to a degree, you could choose your own cast. So that's where the studio system and, and typecasting worked terribly well. Excitement here. 